Well, my name is Dina Garner Smith, and I am um, a member of the Sun Devil Athletic staff. And my specific title is the Senior Associate Athletics Director, Senior Women Administrator. How many of you have heard of the Senior Women Administrator? So for those of you who don't know, um, I'm responsible for health and welfare related issues for all of our student athletes. And in particular, I work with um, and in support of, um, on behalf of the conference, I'm a representative of the council along with the athletic director who is Raymond Anderson and Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson, who's our faculty athletic rep. We make up the council for ASU um, in the PAC-12 conference and we have to vote on key legislation that impacts the various sports and the student athletes and the coaches and their interactions um, as it relates to NCAA operations. So the, as the SWA, um, it's a title, but my role is really as a sport administrator to have um, co-sport oversight, um, meaning I work with Tim and work with all the coaches in our swimming and diving program, as well as gymnastics, um, softball. Uh, we just added women's lacrosse, women's triathlon, and I know there's some other sports that I'm missing right now, water polo, um, as well as uh, the band and the spirit squad. So those are some of the activities from a sport oversight that I'm responsible for. And I basically interface with folks like Tim from an operations perspective, as well as our coaches, including student athletes on issues not necessarily related to how much time are they gonna be in the pool, um, what do you need to do in the pool, but all about here's the schedule for the Pac-12 uh, events that are gonna be on the Pac-12 networks to there's gonna be key legislation that's gonna be voted on the senior women administrators that are, there are 12 of us within the PAC-12 conference, that's 12 schools. So there are 12 SWAs like myself that have to vote as a part of the council on legislation at um, the quarterly PAC-12 conference meetings. And we talk about a lot of different things from time demands to the lawsuits that are still pending out there in the landscape of college athletics. Um, and we are really concerned about just making sure that not only are our student athletes fully supported, um, but also our wonderful administrators, such as Tim and our coaches, because they are key investors in the young people's lives. And we, have, we wanna make sure that we're supporting them to the fullest extent. So that's what I do presently, but in my previous lifetime, um, I just transitioned here from the National Football League in, at the end of May in 2015 and I worked at the National Football League for about seven and a half years, and I worked in two departments. I was um, most recently a part of the Player Engagement Department, which is the department that is basically um, designed to assist players, NFL players, active and former players, as well as their families, um, as they transition into the National Football League to participate in the sport, as well as as they transition out once they've concluded their, their um, time as players, and so we had uh, a variety of oversight responsibilities concerning health and welfare, continuing education, benefits, um, mandatory training, uh, information that we had to disseminate from the commissioner around key policies to make sure that people were operating within the white lines, as they say. So I worked in that department for about four years, and then prior to that, I worked in our security department. Um, by training, I'm a lawyer. I used to be the in my other lifetime. Mm -hmm. I worked at the NCAA for about nine and a half years, and I was an investigator, and I also uh, conducted educational seminars for athletic administrators and student athletes on a variety of issues, um, most notably related to sports gambling, so that's one of the ethics issues I thought I would raise with you guys as one of the challenges when you think about uh, collegiate sports and sports in general, ethics um, issues concerning gambling, game integrity are huge because if you're a sports fan, you want to make sure that you're watching a clean ac activity um, or why would you waste your time? So I, I would work on NCAA legislation related to gambling. I worked on NCAA regu regulations related to agents. So athlete agents is another ethical issue that is not a part of the presentation, but I just thought I'd throw it out there because it's a, it's a very murky area where people obviously need to have appropriate representation as they transition into professional athletics because it is a business. However, sometimes the road leading into that professional status can be very murky and very um, challenging for student athletes as well as their, their family members. And then the last piece of area, of area of responsibility that I had for education and enforcing NCAA rules was related to amateur status. So that was um, an area that has changed over the years 
I think there are some ethical issues. It's not a part of the presentation because I know I only had about 20 minutes to really talk about that. But it is something that you might find interesting because ASU is such a global entity and we have a large international presence of, amongst our student athletes as well as our faculty and staff. So a lot of the amateurism issues that come into play with regard to collegiate athletics are collegiate athletics um, have a bedrock of being amateur athletes that are participating in sport at the collegiate level. Therefore, you're not supposed to professionalize yourself if you're participating in amateur or collegiate athletics. Hi. So um, that's just a little bit of background about me. And the reason that I came here today is I was invited by um, one of the representatives from the Lincoln Center for Ethics. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to address you. So what I'd like to do is just kind of talk about ethics in collegiate athletics, because that's what you signed up for to come. And I'm just going to highlight some things that I thought might be of interest. They are in no way exhaustive, but I thought they might be a little bit um, of interest to you. And I thought perhaps we could have some dialogue. So the topics that I thought we could discuss or would discuss would be um, highlighting some of the key, some key issues that I've seen in my 15 plus year tenure and working in college athletics as well as working in professional athletics. There's a lot of overlap because obviously young people that participate in collegiate athletics, at least from my perspective in football, they transition into the professional um, ranks. Sometimes the behaviors continue to go with them. Um, so when you think about issues related to sexual assault, domestic violence, I mean, those are key issues that are societal issues. They're not athletics issues. There are lots of ethical issues, I think, that come into play with that when people make appropriate decisions or choose not to make appropriate decisions. And then they impact not only the individual, but they impact the collective, um, including the university or the professional franchise if you're working at a, in a professional um, environment. So, uh, substances of abuse are huge. Um, societal issues, not necessarily collegiate athletics issues, but they do affect a lot of colleges, a lot of athletics programs, and certainly a lot of student athletes. Um, gambling or sports integrity is a huge issue, and I mentioned that at the top of the conversation. And then there is a pressure, a lot of pressure on coaches and on, on programs to win at all costs. So oftentimes, the pressures are what makes for poor decision making, and then that clearly, to me, can be an ethical dilemma for the people that are making those decisions, whether it be the, the head coach or coaches involved, or maybe it's an assistant coach, or maybe it's a graduate assistant. Maybe it's not even a person that's earning you know, uh, a large salary, but there's a significant pressure to win in college athletics. Our president and our athletic director, I think, are very keen on being in alignment with the fact that here at ASU, we want to do, we want to win. We want to be in the top five. We want to be competitive, but we want to do it the right way. We had a staff meeting yesterday where we talked about being clean and playing and doing things within the, the um, uh, in an ethical way and within the white lines and doing it appropriately. So we want to make sure that we're, although there is a lot of pressure to win, but we're doing it the right way and we're making sure that we are using and exhausting all of our resources. And we have huge um, resources here at ASU to deal with pressure, to deal with stress, and to deal with all the anxieties that come into play when you're leading a key program or a key marquee um, sport or you're starting up a sport. We've, we've started now two sports that we're bringing online that will be in, um, in full bloom in the fall of this year. And we have one sport that transitioned that was a club sport here on our campus, which is men's hockey. And now it's a division one team. Um, so there's a lot of pressure for these young people and the coaching staff to, to win. So the first topic I thought I'd address, and again, to me, I view this in, not in a vacuum, but these are societal issues. So societal issues such as sexual assault and domestic violence, they affect everyone. So in one of my roles at the NFL, the last position that I had, I oversaw the educational um, outreach of domestic violence and sexual assault, and as it affected um, NFL teams, families within the NFL community, and we would talk about these things, and we would talk about how these are societal issues, they're not athletics issues. However, when you participate in athletics at the collegiate level or at the professional level, clearly there is a public component to that. And so the community is looking at you. The community is a large community. The community is not just people within your specific venue where your franchise is. It's not within the specific community in the valley here at ASU. But a lot of our teams, our men's teams, our women's teams, they're ranked nationally. And so people view them from a, you know, a very large um, environment. And so because of that, they're kind of in a microscope. 
And so we have to always remind them that, you know, as young men and women, you know, most men are not abusive. Most women um, are, are not um, always aware of the fact that there are a lot of men who are key stakeholders in safety and making sure that they and the loved ones that they, they care for, whether they be male or female, you know, have a right to be safe. But we talk about these messages with our student athletes and with our staff about, um, you know, many times in our society, men can remain silent witnesses. Um, and one in four women in our society have reported being abused in their lifetime. Um, when you think about college campuses, the statistics are alarming. 23%, as reported by a CNN article, of women that are on college campuses um, have reported sexual assault. Significant numbers, which is why we have an ethical issue to make sure that we're communicating that to our staff and to our student athletes because we want to make sure that they understand that um, making healthy and appropriate decisions are the best way to engage in appropriate behavior so that they can do what they would like to do, which is to be a student as well as to also participate in athletics. And certainly if we have staff, um, that they are also not um, operating in any other way other than in an appropriate manner and directing um, student athletes or staff to receive appropriate counseling resources that we have here on campus or off campus to take care of these types of behaviors. Because these conversations need to be brought to the light so that those ethical challenges um, are addressed in a healthy way and so that people make the right decisions so that people are not negatively impacted. Because you can see the issues, uh, they don't just affect the, any team, they don't just affect the individual person. That person may be dismissed if they're a student athlete or if they're an administrator, but still the impact is very real. Um, and it, depending on what the role of the individuals involved, again, if you're at the collegiate level or the professional level, it's very public. And so a lot of times you can, you, like if we were having a conversation, I'm having a conversation with Tyler, who I just met, but, and Tyler, you're a student here, you're a grad student, I work in Sun Devil Athletics. I may be on the news tomorrow because of my job responsibilities. You may or may not, depending on what your role and responsibilities are here at ASU. So things that would typically be um, communicated behind closed doors or just in the normal course of society are very different for folks that work in athletics at the collegiate and professional level. Everything is exposed and magnified. So here's a video that I thought I'd show you. I am an equal partner. I am an equal partner. I will not hit. I will not hit. I will not stand for domestic violence. I will not stand for domestic violence. I will accept and respect the word no. I will accept and respect the word no. I will not accept someone who belittles me. I will not accept someone who belittles me. I am not better simply because of my gender. The most common age for females to be affected by domestic violence is 18 to 24. Domestic abuse includes physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. On a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines. I will not participate in domestic violence. I can end 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 domestic violence. I pledge to end domestic violence. ASU has taken the pledge to end domestic violence. Have you? So that's just an example of when, when we look at ethical challenges within ASU and Sun Devil Athletics, that's an example of what our student athletes pulled together and on their own they initiated this to show that we are banding together to raise awareness and to show society and to show our peers on campus who are students, to show our, our faculty, to show our professors, to show anyone who will view this Power of I Am video that we are serious about making sure we're um, engaged in the conversation that we are going to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And so I just thought it was a beautiful display on their own to put this together. We have shared this with um, our partners on campus during Domestic Violence Awareness Month and we continue to work together collaboratively to address these issues. Um, knowing that, like I said, I know this discussion that we are having today um, is around ethics, but these are some of the things that I think come into play when you think about the societal impact and where and what the role of college athletics plays. And we want to be on the positive side, not so much always on the negative or the reactive side. And so that was something proactively that our student athletes were engaged in. So this other topic, um, substances of abuse, is a huge ethical issue. I think it's a dilemma for um, administrators at the high school, the college, and the professional level. 
When you think about um, substances of abuse, I just thought I'd share this, this uh, I know it's a lot of words, but I thought I would share some of it because I thought it was really important for you to see. Um, when you think about excessive drinking, when you think about alcohol and substances of abuse and the use amongst college, at college athletes and or college student athletes, the proportionality of self-reported um, influences and self-reported um, abuse is, is interesting. So student athletes, um, overall student athletes report using alcohol um, less than their counterparts who are students and they report less likely to be um, abused substance of abuse because they have to be tested oftentimes. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have student athletes who have um, not done the right thing. They may have addiction just like people in society, um, just like students, just like other people who are not students or student athletes. Um, but there are mechanisms in place within athletics that are designed to be proactive so that when you view a track meet or when you're watching the basketball game or when you're watching, um, you know, hopefully you have watched our water polo matches or our tennis matches, you will know that these student athletes are participating in their sport in, in a clean manner and there are mechanisms in place to address some of the issues related to the substances of abuse and most of them are not abusing the process or not abusing the system, but those who may have failed drug tests, as there are protocols that we have in place to address these things. Um, I think it's challenging for faculty and staff and some of you who are working with you know, that population, you don't have students that go through drug testing. You don't have faculty necessarily that go through drug testing protocols because your process is very different. So the fact that in sport, we want to make sure we're operating within the jurisdiction and the requirements as defined by the NCAA, we don't have, a, we have to do these things. And so there are mechanisms in place to address some of those some of those issues um, so that when, when you think about um, um, sporting events being compromised because people are doping or they are ineligible because they failed three drug tests, well, there's a process at the campus level, at the conference level, and then at the NCAA level, depending on when the competition occurs and when the test happens to, um, to be taken. Gambling and sports integrity. I thought I would highlight this um, because I recognize where I am. I don't know, how many of you, just by a show of hands, were familiar uh, with this point shaving case? Yeah. Okay. Points don't have hair. I don't understand what point shaving is. So point shaving is meaning game integrity. So there was money wagered on the game. Um, so as you can see, so, so Steven Smith was the starting point guard for the men's basketball program here at ASU. And in 1994, he and one of his um, teammates, Isaac Burton, unfortunately, they had a friendship with um, a campus bookie. So campus meaning he was, this young man was um, 21. He enrolled in ASU at the same time when Steven and Isaac were student athletes on the men's basketball team. Benny Smith, is, Benny Silman was um, a student from New York and he moved here and he had a, a, like a, a little kiosk business, a coffee business in the formerly known America West Arena. And so he operated his little kiosk, because he was a money guy, so he operated his little kiosk and he befriended the basketball student, because he's from New York. And he befriended the basketball student, well, that too, he befriended the basketball, but, but basketball was his thing. So he befriended the basketball student athletes and two of them, were indicated on the slide, Benny and, I'm sorry, um, Isaac and Steven, also known as Headache. And so the- Steven Headache Smith. Steven, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've been around here too long. <laughs> yep, and I know, I know both Steven and I know Benny uh -huh. because of my years working at the NCAA. So after this, so what happened was they had a relationship um, at the time, because this was 1994, that was pre-Twitter, that was pre-Snapchat, that was pre all these other apps that you have. So a lot of the entertainment that a lot of the students and student athletes would engage in were video games. And they would have these huge tournaments where they would, um, they would win money, they, or they would bet on who's gonna win. And so Benny, because he was a bookie, as you indicated, he, he, I mean, that was kind of his thing too. It was like a hook for people that were in his peer group. They would bet on these games and then they would become indebted to him because he was the book. And so then in order to pay him back, he was like, that's okay, don't worry about it. You just need to make sure you that you- Manage the spreads. Right. And you can work the, 
Correct. Okay. So unfortunately, this university suffered this um, occurrence, um, and this <coughs> clearly was these student athletes and the administrators had a dilemma. They had an ethical dilemma. The student athletes were only 21. Benny was only 21, but unfortunately, there were outside influences that were in the gambling world, and they were underground because they were La Cosa Nostra. They were the mob. I remember one of the things. I'm like, when you see a kid riding around in a twenty-eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Right. All these boom boxes, right. these tires, all this, this, this new stuff mm -hmm. from the Fifth Ward in Houston. Right. That should put a question mark. Flags. Put flags, red flags. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the uh, Stephen K. Smith. Correct. And people didn't investigate it right. hard enough right. or tough enough. Right. It was a very uh, dark period. Uh, very dark. Mm -hmm. Very dark period. Mm -hmm. I covered this in my class uh, that I teach, and uh, since I was here when, Ms. when Stephen Smith and Benny Silver was here, mm -hmm. that was one of the things that you, you got the vehicles that you were driving. Right. That was a red flag mm -hmm. right off the bat. And if you know anything about Fifth Ward and Houston, you know you know what that is. was a tough situation, but, and, and the university got a black eye. Right. But I would say 2016, the university has done wonderful things related to raising awareness of game integrity and just integrity in general. And the athletics department <clears throat> constantly communicates, not about this incident. This was, a, this was one incident involving the people that are <coughs> indicated on the slide. But the subject matter is very critical to the integrity of the sporting events and the integrity of making sure that, again, my responsibility as well as the other administrators, including Tim, we're responsible for our student athletes' health and welfare. We're responsible for all of our staff health and welfare. And when you are engaged in these types of activities, there are state laws, there are federal laws that govern where you can and cannot participate in this activity. In the state of Arizona, it is not legal to bet on a collegiate or a professional sporting contest. So that's a whole separate issue. In addition, the NCAA has co uh, protocols and rules and regulations, as well as ASU has rules and regulations that prohibit this type of behavior from anyone um, at the university. So faculty, staff, students, no athletics administrators or student athletes can, can to this day participate in the activities. I think that post-1994, post-1990, the NCAA, when I was working there, and my peers who still continue to work there, continue to raise awareness on the issues, and all of the professional leagues do as well. The NBA has some different ways of engaging and raising awareness, but the NFL and the NCAA and Major League Baseball um, and the National Hockey League, we would band together and we would talk about these issues all the time because of the scandals that impacted the sports franchises and the leagues. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, betting situation in Vegas got so skewed yes. that they uh, they brought in the federal authorities. They had to. And and, and, and that's how it was. They it, started to go down to investigate it, mm -hmm. and that's how it was exposed. That's that correct. correct. That's correct. So what happened here on the slide is this all occurred when these student athletes were still eligible. Then they left school, and then, the, as you said, the federal government found out about the money that was wagered. They, they placed two wagers. I think they were in excess of, um, well, it was almost a million dollars that was spread throughout these various books, um, which are casino sporting entities in Nevada. And it was during conference play in the Pac-10 at that time. So the operators who are responsible for the gaming houses in the sports book were like, wait a minute, this is skewed. The line is off here. And so they have an obligation, per their protocols, to contact the Las Vegas um, Gaming, the Nevada Gaming Control Board, who then investigate. And then whenever there is irregularity and there looks to be criminal activity, they then have to contact the FBI, because these are federal um, jurisdiction type matters. So that's what happened. And that happened separate and apart from the state of Arizona and ASU. And then when the federal government took a hold of the case, they had enough evidence. And then by that time, these two student athletes were gone. Um, and then Benny Silman, he was not cooperative. He went to prison. Um, 
Isaac Burton and Stevan, they served, um, uh, I think they served a few months in jail, but they did cooperate. But there were other people that are not on the slide that were right. not connected to they ASU. Were fringed, Correct. Fringed people. There were fringe mob people that were involved. I'm talking about real mob I know, people. right. Right. So that was not helpful. So again, ethical dilemmas, unfortunately. Um, the landscape of gambling has shifted. Now it looks like FanDuel, and it looks like, I um, can't remember the name of the other, FanDuel, DraftKings. And, oh, this is just for, it's just, you know, for play, it's not for real. Well, that's not what the state of New York said at this moment in time. So these are, these are very troubling issues. There's a lot of different ways people can split hairs and determine what is and what is not considered gambling. Um, in my previous job at the NFL, my responsibility was to communicate policy to the teams. So I would be communicating about our NFL gambling policy out of all the four leagues that was the most strict policy. However, it was strict for personnel, players, not strict for owners. So it was okay that an owner could own um, horses um, and race at the racetracks and they could have gambling revenue that they would derive from their franchise owned stadium but the players could not participate in any type of gambling so lots of issues there so anyway thought you might find that interesting this is a video that I thought you might find um, well if I can figure out how to, I'm not sure how to play it let's see oh. try clicking the advanced it might activate it. no I have to click it on the about 12,000 people have logged on to collegegambling.org in the short time since we've launched the website. And we encourage everybody to visit collegegambling.org, even if they don't think they have a problem. It's important for everyone to be educated about gambling disorders and responsible gaming, and perhaps to stop a problem before it starts. When we talk to adult individuals who have a disordered gambling problem, what we learn is that, almost without fail, they started in their teens and in their early 20s. So this is an ideal time for us as educators to talk to a generation, to talk to a demographic, to educate them in terms of what is healthy, healthy, fun type activities to engage in and when does it cross a line and become a problem. So um, the point of showing the ASU that story about the um, unfortunate circumstance that happened here at ASU is just to raise awareness that in 2016 it's still an issue because our athletics department is still participating at a very high level in athletics and gambling and game integrity is a huge issue. Um, we still have similar rules and regulations um, and we try to communicate those on a very effective basis and have open dialogue with administrators, student athletes, as well as um, anyone who is around our teams to make sure that they understand that we cannot participate in these types of events. And if there are people that are trying to make in inroads to get inside information for purposes of gambling or to actually get information and then try to compromise anyone on our um, staff that you report it. Report it to your coach, report it to the athletic director, report it to your supervisors, report it to operations, whomever. Just raise it in the light because you never know who's asking. So we, we have these conversations, especially around the time that we go into postseason competition because that's usually when the, um, the games are on the boards in the sports books in Nevada and other places in the world. So here's just, you know, here, I just thought that this slide would be helpful for you. Like in that case in particular, you see that the impact was not just, it didn't just impact Isaac and Stevan and Benny. I mean, it impacted the school. It impacted all of the administrators who were working here at ASU at that time, including the president. Everybody that worked here at that time was affected in a very, very real way. And then the NCA consequences came after the government was involved. And so there was, a lot of money and revenue that had to be paid back by this university because of the fact that the issue was not raised to administrators at the time that they allowed for the student athletes to participate and play. Thus, the ethical dilemma. If you don't know what's going on, you have to ask those questions on a regular basis. But there's going to be situations where people are not going to tell you. So you have to be able to look for other reasons and other areas of um, flags, if you will, to figure it out.
Can I ask a question about that? Yes. I'm kind of interested in, in um, technology and, and this whole kind of culture of, if I can use the word, innovation. Yes. That word just is way too common here. <laughs> but with uh, the idea of maybe bringing it to bear on this situation, do you have like, um, are you doing any research or doing any work on using technology to better inform some of those other flags? Because when you deal with this, it's, you know, when, when it comes to money, America mm -hmm. has essentially t digitized money right. to the point where everything can be tracked. Correct. So to what degree are you kind of like, what do you have on, on in terms of trying to well, well, we work. We work. This so. area of education and compliance is is really um, the purview of our compliance department. They are the ones that um, uh, provide education. A lot of the mainstay education <coughs> around here's the NCA policy, here's ASU's policy, and here are the resources. And just understand what the bright lines are. And then, as it relates to if you're going to have the Pac-12 competition in a venue where there is legal gambling, you still need to understand what your obligations are and your responsibilities are. Um, the philosophy of our department is, you know, we want to treat people with respect and make sure that they clearly understand their roles and responsibilities, um, but we're, there's no tracking device necessarily of their money. However, we clearly tell them, if you go in these venues, you are already a high profile individual because you're already on the game program. They're going to know who you are. So whether you try to go in with a hat or whatever, you still are going to be prominently no. I mean, they're going to know who you are. So you probably d need to understand that the visibility is very heightened around these games. Um, and if you're going to be in these venues where there's gambling, just know that you shouldn't be sharing any type of information about your competition, um, inside information with people that are not inside if they're not in your locker room they don't need to know unless it's the media asking you something after you've already been prepped by the sports and information people yes it also might be a case where after the fact is where technology comes into play yes there's a really good article or a podcast on ProPublica talking about the tennis matches mm -hmm. and the fixing there right. and one of the reasons they were able to figure out who did it is by looking at thousands of data points right. on what happened when the initial you know, point spread mm -hmm. or whatever that was was set, and then look at how the <coughs> betting changed right. when things shifted, and then look at the results of the match. Mm -hmm. So that's something that years ago, you, you might have, have to go with a gut feel, but right. this way they were able to put everybody in there, look right. at the betting habits, look at the results. Based and on forensic cameras. Correct. Yeah, and, and find a few people who were outliers on how often they lost once right. the betting shifted. And, and to, your, to your point about tracking, one of the other things that we do do, um, we do also engage in, is a better way to say it, right? <laughs> um, is in our compliance department and as sport administrators, we're required to make sure we're having open dialogue with our administrators, so op open dialogue with our directors of operations, with our coaches. So when you are, when your program, whether it's basketball or football, um, baseball has had these gambling scandals. I haven't seen it in Tim's, Tim's with our swimming program. I haven't seen this in swimming. But now I know that there may have been a couple of international events um, at the Olympic level with some other sports, but I don't remember anything with swimming um, where there's been match fixing occurring. Um, but my point is, with our environments, you have to get tickets to go. And so if student athletes are allotted, I'm not sure how many tickets to go to, that they can give to their families and friends? Uh, six. Six, okay, so if they go in, so swimming's gonna be going to the Pac-12, so how many tickets they get? They get six. So you have a way to track who's getting those comp tickets. So the point is, you wanna make sure that if you're running the program, you need to know who's around your program because if there are outliers around your program, those are flags, and then you can pull the comp tickets. You can find out if the people that, I'm making this up, Johnny gave tickets to, are, is that an agent? Is that a, who is this person? And then you can then inquire of the athletics department or other people to try and do some intel because you wanna make sure that people are safe, most important and most paramount. And so there were other ways that when I worked at the NCAA, we would do that when I worked on these gambling related issues because we didn't have the technology that you mentioned, but the government does. Sure. So we would bring in the government to explain to our teams, look, here's what happens. So you Leave might not- for many notes on Sawyer. We're gonna find out about it. Yeah, I mean, they're gonna find out. So you just need to understand, here's what happens when it leaves our realm of responsibility. It goes over here. And the government has all these different controls. In addition, the gambling venues, 
they want to operate in a clean manner, so they have all kind of mechanisms. They have cameras. Absolutely. They can track every dollar. They have people that are staged in some of these um, sports books because they have to make sure that they're um, observing the communication and observing what's happening so there's no cheating going on. They lose. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not helping them because they want to operate above board too. Mm -hmm. So we, we bring in those types of individuals as well to talk to our um, student athletes. At least that's my understanding. I've only been here since June, so I haven't seen that yet. But I know that our compliance department brings different people um, to talk with our teams that are going into postseason competition and talk about these issues, especially where we have, we as an NCAA or we as collegiate athletics have had some challenges. So when you think about those sports, basketball, um, football, baseball have been the ones that are probably the most affected. So, and then here's, you know, just a thought about what types of things that we all can do. And when we talk to our student athletes and our athletic administrators, we, you know, this is a collective responsibility. So when you think about all the issues that I, that I hit on earlier, we all have a responsibility to just be aware and to make sure we are aware of our resources and we are aware of who, who's, whose jurisdiction is it. If it's Sun Devil Athletics and there's an issue, please let us know. If it's on campus, you need to know what those resources are. If the topic or if the issue is related to domestic, domestic abuse or sexual assault, ASU has huge resources, wonderful resources. And how do you make sure that if you see something, say something, because obviously silence will imply approval for some people. And we always talk about, with our student athletes about modeling appropriate behavior. So if we want to get the results that we're preaching about or talking about, we don't need to preach, but we need to model the behavior. So speaking up is really important. And taking advantage of resources, because it's very stressful to be in college, period. And it's even more stressful at certain points in time during the athletics experience to not know how to appropriately deal with the stress, which oftentimes is part of what's going on with some people who make unfortunate and inappropriate decisions that you know they're trying to figure out the pros and cons. Um, so I think it's a really great opportunity for us to create dialogue um, around some of these issues. And I just thought I would share with you some of the resources that I found online and some of the resources that we talk about often with our um, SDA personnel and our student athletes. So with that, that is my presentation. Yes. So it sounds like you have a big, you and your team have a big job of creating this culture of awareness. Letting Correct. Letting everybody know that we're going to be asking these questions, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. And I could only imagine you run up against, as, as we all do in each of our own departments, you know, there's a way that things have gotten done on this campus. <coughs> Sometimes it's not always positive and, sure. you know, how do you handle that? Because I can only imagine that you run up against some people that don't want, they would rather not know. You know? Well, it, it starts from the AD down. Well, it starts from the president down. Yeah. So President Crow is very involved and very aware of what's going on in Sun Devil Athletics, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Because I know I've, when I was at the NCAA and as an investigator, I would see the opposite with some, some institutions that I might have been investigating or providing education. They're not there. Um, the AD's not there at some of those, well, why not? This is important, especially when you're talking about game integrity and gambling. What? You're not here. I don't understand that. So that tells your, what are you telling your student athletes and your athletic administrators if you're not there and you're in charge of the program? Now, clearly I understand that the president is not able to be everything, but our president is heavily invested. Our athletic director is heavily invested in making sure that we have a positive environment. Um, and that we're having dialogue and that we're talking with administrators. So Tim, I'm gonna ask you, what, what are your thoughts about how we raise awareness? Some of these things we have, you and I haven't talked about, like the gambling piece, we haven't, but some of these things we talk about on a regular basis. Right, um, just kind of talking about, kind of starting from the top down um, with you know our athletic director and Dina, you know, coming to our competitions, interacting with our student athletes on a daily basis kind mm -hmm. of shows the support that they're giving and the investment and it kind of raises I think the students level of you know we have to do it the right way it raises the coaches levels we have to do the, it the right way because we're being looked at we're being observed we're being watched and we're being supported and in, in, in a positive way yeah positive um, not not of, a gotcha no no not like yeah. big brother or anything but no just, um, you know they're they're rooting for us they they want the student athletes to succeed so kind of having that oversight and the support yeah. from the <clears throat> administrative and from the, the top down, I think, really helps everyone to kind of shift their mindset to, to something more. Right. 
I hope so. Find an ethical, yeah. I hope so. And I think that, you know, making the right hiring decisions, and I know that there's no perfect hire, <coughs> but at least when you hire someone, you want to go through a vetting process and you want to make sure that they're clear. Here are the expectations and make sure what that they understand what those expectations are and that they understand what our culture is. Mm -hmm. And that we, we don't operate an SDA in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that experience was like prior to me coming in 2015. But many athletics programs that I have become familiar with over my 15, 20 years working in, the, in this environment operated in a vacuum. Well, now with social media, no athletics program at the collegiate level can operate in a vacuum without having a problem at some point. No question. That goes to our question. I mean, what you do or what you fail not to do, you're still held accountable. Correct. And that goes from the leadership of the university all the way down to the students. And in my class, one of the things that I have a sign, that means you got a black <laughs> eye behind you. Mm. You know, you get one of those, you got a black <laughs> eye. It's really, really distasteful when one of your peers from the University of Minnesota calls you and asks you about something like that. Mm -hmm. That's where it gets really kind of, hey, nobody likes to get one of those calls. And right. You know, you know, it, but when it happens, what are you guys doing out there? Right. Uh, you guys got a gambling house going on? Or what's going on? Right. I mean, it's a, one of those things, a black eye for one. And, and again, you know, having just come from a, a <clears throat> professional team or a professional sports organization, a lot of my peers, um, supervisors at the NFL, didn't think that they would be as affected as they have been by domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse. You couldn't have told me in 2008 when I started working at the NFL that that would have been the most horrendous period of time to work there. I, I would never have believed that that would have been the case, because we had a policy. They still have a policy. It wasn't about the policy. It was about how did you apply the policy, and then how did you communicate the consequences, and then who did you talk to to make the appropriate decision. But unfortunately, that was a huge issue for them. And then, you know, some things you can't keep dialing back because of social media. And so in, the, in that particular instance with the first video that came out, they didn't need a video to do the right thing because they already had information, because that's what you do, you get information. But then that just exacerbated. So my point is, now in 2016 and moving forward, the internet's not gonna shut down, I don't think. So all this stuff is public, and even if it's not on TMZ or Al Jazeera, somebody has a camera phone somewhere, and even it's gonna classroom. be recorded, even in your classroom, even, even, even in the locker rooms. Right. So it's not about scaring people, it's just about making sure people are clear on here's our culture, and if you have some concerns and you cannot comply with what we're offering you, which are wonderful things from an athletics department perspective, then maybe you don't need to be a part of our program. But if you are gonna be a part of our program, it's all of our responsibility to make sure we're helping each other, we're a resource for each other, and we're holding each other accountable to raise the bar um, as it relates to our integrity and just making sure that we're a good community partner in athletics, in society, and also on this campus. So that's what we try to strive to do every day. It's a lot, but it's <laughs> it's 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 fascinating. I mean, it's it's been a passion of mine for the last you know over 20 years. So I, I it's not it's 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 work because you're trying to get it right. Um, but it's it's helpful when you have people that are that you're working with. It's not just one person's responsibility. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Because the bigger issue, I mean, this is more, I think, around football, and I'm not really a sports person, so you can probably tell, but um, the issue of, um, of concussive injuries in mm -hmm. football, one of the, one of the criticisms it, that I've read, uh, in particular about the NFL, is that um, the media storm around domestic abuse was, in a way, used as cover. And it wasn't. Right. Well, I mean, there are there are a lot. There of, were two yeah. different things going on. Well, there, yeah, it depends <laughs> on. I mean, there are folks written on this, right? So it depends yeah. on your point of view. What I'm curious about is from a from a from a, like an ethics point of view, does the big bigger question of how football is played in and out out of college, and whether it's appropriate to put young men in these kind of extremely violent confrontational sports, is that question something that falls under your purview? Mine, no. Our athletics department and the AD, yes. These are conversations that we have. So um, our athletics director is, is Ray is very involved, and 
um, works with the Collegiate Football Foundation, um, and he works within the, so the, how do I explain this? So the NFL had what they call a competition committee, which was comprised of key stakeholders that were um, general managers of certain teams, um, coaches, prominent coaches, different position coaches, and other representatives, and they would vote on or they would pass rules to make the game safer every year. Um, so the collegiate ranks didn't have such a thing. So what Ray has done as he has transitioned from the NFL um, since he's been here two years now, has pushed forward the um, opportunity for the NCAA to have a college model of a competition committee to talk about health and healthy and safeguards um, and to not just address concussions, but just making sure that the game is safe, every aspect of the game is safe at the collegiate level, and making sure that when you think, when you talk about concussions and you talk about the um, negative effects of um, participating in football, that we're trying to reduce those and we're having open dialogue, not just with football people, but also with medical personnel. And it's not just football to me, also. It is not just football. Joe Mauer has been playing with it. It is, it is It is. not just football. There are a lot. Soccer. Lacrosse. Right. Lacrosse, volleyball, volleyball hockey. Also, there's severe kind of concerns about. Yes. You know. Swimming. Um, we, well, not swimming. Diving. Mm -hmm. Diving, we've, you know, that can happen. Um, so we, we have, Ray has really been a torchbearer to raise awareness based on his previous experience in the National Football League and then having worked at the, um, at the Falcons as the general manager there. So yes, the dialogue is constantly occurring, but to your point about when I was working at the NFL, the, the crazy situations that you have when you're working at that level is the media, but oftentimes the media doesn't get all, they don't put out all of the information. So in my department, um, I was responsible for the education. So we would talk about health and welfare, and there was already a lot of research and education and communication that had gone out to families around wellness and around um, the resources available. I cannot speak for the specific medical science because I wasn't in those conversations, but the domestic violence piece, that was, that was real. I mean, that was just separate, and that was poor decision making that then resulted in you know, other things that also were going on at the same time that this whole concussion issue was being raised, so you had two very, I don't even know, I mean, two very prominent issues in addition to um, sexual assault and then child abuse, because with um, Adrian, well, with Adrian Peterson, there were all, it, all these different issues around how do you rear your child and, and child abuse, what's not child abuse, so all those things were going on at the same time, but I do think that as a result of um, all the media attention and a lot mm -hmm. of the um, different uh, social activism and just the emphasis on these particular issues more science will come out and I think that that's a good thing because you want to make sure that if any parent is going to allow their child to play any sport they want to make sure that their child's going to be safe and is not going to be crippled for the rest of their lives because they choose to play any sport whether it be diving lacrosse hockey or let alone football I'm not sure if everyone's aware but Steve Corman is a professor here at ASU in the um, School of Communications just got a $400,000 grant to study concussion. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, from what I understand. Where did the grant come from? Was, was it, it NCAA? National, I, I'm not sure if it was NCAA. Football, uh, oh, I know we have, a, I know we're working with TGen and we're doing some other things with uh, concussion research. Um, but I think, given that it's in the communications school, it's more about athlete willingness mm -hmm. to communicate to trainers when they right. have a concussion because it's impacting you know, their potential future career Correct. versus like a league not telling someone <coughs> right. what the dangers are. I mean, we have really open dialogue with our, like, like Tim said, we have open dialogue with our student athletes. Our coaches do as well. And then we've done other things that are, um, that at the collegiate level, it wasn't necessarily um, promulgated or um, mandated. Uh, for example, to have an additional spotter that is separate from the football staff, that is separate from the conference, that is watching every game to figure, okay, it, does this person, if this person got hit, if it's a women's soccer athlete, or if it's um, our football athlete, are they able to go back into play based on what they observed as an independent person? So these are new um, 
uh, modifications to existing protocols that I think are going to be really positive, again, to make all of our competitions as safe as possible. And it's set NCAA. NCAA. Well, yeah. NCAA. Yeah. NCAA Mind Matters Research Challenge. So Dr. Brian Hayline. Was this, was this, did you have questions? Yeah, uh, so concerning the concussion thing. So we just went through an enumerated all these scores where concussions mm -hmm. are an issue. And it sounds to me like it's just the nature of the beats. So what do we do? Do we change rules in soccer? No more headers or flag football, no more tackling? I mean, that is a rule well, that we don't want to be, in soccer. Sure, they we have, don't want to be paternalistic. I mean, people have autonomy, you know, if they want to choose to do this thing, let them do it. Well, people so. do have autonomy, but, and it is the nature of the beast, but it's the nature of the beast that it's a multi, billion dollar industry because that changes what people are willing, what parents are right. willing to, to accept sure. and it changes people's judgment. So when parents mm -hmm. do look at an activity and say, is this appropriate for my child? Part of part of their judgment is skewed heavily by the fact that, <clears throat> that A, they might be a rabid sports fan because like all things that are driven by billions of dollars in advertising, they are not autonomous. They're driven uh, and to a great degree by how their attention sure. is focused by the media beyond their control. And also by the fact that they might say, well, there's money here for my child's education. I mean, the idea, this is a bigger conversation mm -hmm. about whether, and I think whether, it's, you know, whether the money in sports in America is, is, uh, is not something that's completely uh, problematic through and through from an ethical point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, I don't think it really is about, I mean, paternalistic versus individual free will and, and autonomy, because I feel like when you when you layer uh, a segment of the economy that's so uh, huge and so dynamic from a transactional point of view in terms of the amount of money that's moving around, when you layer that on top of it, personal autonomy really goes out the window. So. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Push. Or at least certainly is at least is at least Yeah, there's more that might be proving too much, because I mean, we're all influenced by it. Right. When you look at countries that don't, where where the education system is not funded by football alumni, I think you see very different kind of relationships evolving. I mean, America is really the only country in the world where universities rely on their football teams for their bottom line. Yeah. Right. So I mean, that's that's something that really. I mean, this isn't universities aren't universities. <laughs> there, in, in a way, they are research establishments with very large football teams. I mean, that's how <laughs> that that's how universities have been in, in America, many universities for a long time. Mm -hmm. You look at the Happy Valley situation. Right. The idea that this entire community's sense of being and sense of self I, I is attached to a football team is insane. That Happy Valley deal is where they're located at. And you know, they're so isolated. Right. I mean, and, and they just jump in every Saturday, Friday, yeah. Thursday night. There's and nothing else to do. Just <laughs> and so But it didn't necessarily have to just be football. It could have been right, another sport. Right. Yeah. yeah. And they're committed to they're, they're, they're probably one of the five universities that could survive one of those things. Right. right. Hey, anybody else? Right. They, 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 they would have been closed. I agree. But what they have done, they've come back and they've come back strong. And uh, they have some real, uh, I mean, they have some real stout programs there too. But they're probably one of the five universities mm -hmm. that could have survived something like that. As we're talking about the Sandusky deal, I spent two and a half class periods. And happened to be one of the, my students knew this individual, and he would frequent his <coughs> parents' restaurant. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it provides a lot of uh, dialogue for us. Absolutely. And then I have <laughs> another question. Yes, if I think we have two minutes, and then we'll stop the, the case. The uh, NFL, they have uh, found a way, or they're attempting to create a, a group of people that are going out to these young teams to teach them basically the, one of the trauma things about tackling. Mm -hmm. Is that not correct? Yeah, they okay. have the Is, how, how, USA the youth, football. USA football, right. right. It's a youth thing, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, what they're trying to do is protect the industry. Right. I mean, and, Player health and safety. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's a bunch of smart people up there, like you said. I mean, it's just all about edu raising yeah, awareness right. and making sure that it's safe. Well, and I think raising awareness, I, I think a lot of what you see, and it's kind of what you were saying with flag football and where the rules are. <clears throat> I have a husband who was a high school football coach for 12 years, but I can tell you that given the culture of Pop Warner football and the fact that you've got a lot of uneducated, football-educated right. people um, 
teaching kids not how to tackle correctly and putting them at risk for concussion. I have a kid, you know, a son that probably will not play tackle mm -hmm. football. And that has probably less to do with high school football and college football than the training that's going into these mm -hmm. young athletes who eventually are then going to go and, you know, lead with their head and, and do all these things that could put them at risk. Right. Very interesting. This Very interesting. Sport, the 27th largest industry in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Accountants, clergymen, right. every team has a clergyman. Mm -hmm. every, I mean, unbelievable amount of people. And I know we have to, as a society, <coughs> have to, it's part of what we do. And I mean, what are you going to do? Just, or embrace it and try to get it under control and make sure that it's moving forward in a productive right way. Create your culture, right? right. Create your culture. And that's, and they and don't that's have what they're issues. attempting to do is, yeah. is try to make sure that the culture and the people that's leading it, and leadership is always the key. Right. And just like Ray Anderson is doing. I mean, he's pushing for some things that are long overdue. Right. And uh, as, as you do that, you, 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 you have a chance to avoid those even edits. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, I mean, you got to change and you got to stay up with the time, folks. And then, hey, this, it's not going anywhere. Even even when the Ivies cut out their <coughs> competition level, they still have football teams. Yeah. <coughs> yep, on that note, I think we'll end our session. Thank you. Thank you.